Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to another Detroit, Michigan, the history. So, uh, I know the the first slide says 1930 to 1944. I don't think we're going to quite make it to 44 um, and don't really want to. So, uh, this will probably be 1930 to 1940. And as usual, a lot of things happen that were very influential in the greatest city in the world. So let's uh, let's say hello, and we'll get right into it. Dog Mama, hello, hello. Bad Dazzle, what's up, Mike? Alex, what's up, man? Linda, hello, good to see you. Digger, hello, hello. AP, what's up, buddy? All right. So, uh, 1930. So we just got off the Roaring Twenties. We just finished World War I, uh, and we're starting to come in to... The Great Depression. So this encompasses the entire 1930s. Um, so the 30s was rather light with with history and with historic happenings. Um, and I had to put a lot more work into finding things. Um, but there was a lot of good things. They just didn't have anything on them. Uh, there wasn't any history on them. And I think in large part, it's because this whole decade was part of this Great Depression. And and it's a history in America that we would like to forget about. It's a history in Detroit we'd like to forget about. And there's not a lot of uh, good or happy or fun things that happened during this time frame. Uh, so the 1930s was the Great Depression. It was a severe global and economic downturn that affected many countries across the world. We're probably going through one of those right now. Uh, we're probably going through the second depression or about to, um, unless it can be arrested with, with war or that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the news today, the real IRL news, but, uh, the news today was that Saudis, uh, Iran, uh, and there was a whole host of countries, uh, joined BRICS and that that does everything but end the petrodollar. So the United States is going to be in a bad spot again. And hence the reason why I think we'll 
certainly see another war uh, because they'll try and drag us out of uh, drag us out of this this period, the Great Depression. So uh, we're going to start with the Vidya. Um, and this is kind of related to Detroit, but it's the country as a whole. And and it highlights the problem that we just came out of this big industrial boom. We just came out of this Henry Ford. We came out of, you know, the greats. Thomas Edison was in Detroit inventing and uh, manufacturing things. We, I mean, there was just a whole host of people that were making all these great products, uh, products that would change the world and during the Industrial Revolution. And then nobody had money to spend. And there was nothing for anybody to do. And we started to see some layoffs, which will lead into things that we see future as we go down the road in this show. Um, but there were a lot of downstream effects due to this and due to the start. So we'll start with this one. Closing time. The close of an era. The great big I love these two. The They're so great. Is over. All over. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun, and there is a new word. Depression. Little man, what now? Well, you can always sell surplus apples, five cents apiece, on the street corner. And if you're bewildered, panicky at what's happening to you and your country, you aren't alone. One of America's... And of course, I'm still on the draw. Let me see if I can do this. So, nope. You you saw it. The sandwich boards, they would put their qualifications, everything about them, and and just really try to do whatever they could to make themselves marketable because... The factory jobs were gone. That five dollars a day that Ford was paying out was gone. It was just gone, and there was no production. Um, the war production was over, so all the all the individuals that were hired for that were gone. They were unemployed. Um, this is fun. I love the music of the thirties. Good deal. Um, so there was a lot just that just vanished. It was just gone, and uh, people were making a decent wage. You know. Uh, like at Ford Motor Company, five dollars a day. That was a big deal back then for a lot of the immigrants and a lot of the the unskilled labor that was around. And to have that gone where your next is selling broke people apples on the side of the road for a nickel apiece. What's up, Dave? How you doing, buddy? Uh that makes that tough. That makes it really tough to to get by. Um five dollars a day wouldn't be much now. Um, but it was huge back then and it was huge with the factories. And then we had all this overproduction and it wasn't going to end anytime soon because they continued to produce and there, there's backlogs of stuff and stuff was, it just, people didn't have money to buy it. The biggest industrialist has openly admitted, I am afraid. Every man is afraid. Prosperity is just around the corner, say the hopeful headlines. But around the corners wind the lengthening bread lines, and a whole new class of citizens appears in American society. The new poor. And when private charity can no longer carry the burden, the states are forced to act. The New York governor, Franklin Roosevelt, is the first to supply direct emergency relief to the unemployed. The same paralysis that lames the cities blights the farms. And out in the country, too, men are asking, what's wrong? What's happening? Farm prices have dropped disastrously, and a man's work no longer brings him a just return. The threat of foreclosure, of losing house and home, spreads through the conservative farmlands, and radical talk is boiling into action. <laughs> In Iowa, the Farmers Holiday Association organizes to block the flow of farm product to the city in an attempt to force prices up. 
it is illegal action. But one farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. Well, it, that's awesome, David. But it's, uh, I talked about this the other day. Um, both my parents were born in 34. I can't imagine what my grandparents did to hang in there. Um, that's why we get so much of, and I guess it could be unique to me, but we get a lot of the, the older generation that eats a lot of, uh, like my grand, my great grandparents would eat cow tongue and liver and that kind of stuff. It's because that's what you had. You had to survive. You had to make it. You had to move past it. It wasn't, oh, I'm just going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to go to Taco Bell. It was you had what was there. And you either ate it and survived or or you didn't. And a lot of people suffered during this time. Um, and a time of a lot of turmoil. Uh, and just, just kind of crazy. Just kind of crazy. Crisis spreads. From all over the country, unemployed veterans of World War I march on Washington, 15,000 of them. They demand immediate payment of a cash bonus promised them for the future. They need it now. They want it now. But the Senate votes no, and authorities see in the bonus marchers a mob animated by the spirit of revolution, a menace to the nation's capital. Troops disperse the veterans and burn down their shanty settlement. Yeah. Not since the Civil War has such pressure, political, economic, social, centered on the White House. In the face of a hostile press and a divided Congress, Herbert Hoover makes unprecedented use of government power to encourage recovery. But his fundamental faith is in the rugged individualism of the American people and in private enterprise. Economic depression, he says, cannot be cured by legislative action. But the basic causes of the deepening crisis remain stubbornly obscure even to the business leaders summoned to the White House. The explanation offered by humorist Robert Benchley is as good as any. Now, what were the primary causes of the Depression, as we called it? Overproduction, maladjustment in gold distribution, overproduction, deflation, too little thyroid secretion or flax disease, too much vermouth, overproduction, and by the same token, underproduction. Then, too, there was the Gulf Stream. All of these helps lead to inflation, deflation, and overproduction, with a consequent depression. Many are beyond joking. A report from Detroit says men are sitting in the parks all day long, out of work, muttering to themselves. And especially you have to take into account that time where if you if you weren't able to provide for your family, you were an absolute failure. Like uh, men were held to a different standard. They were different, different characters, um, different elk. Uh, if you weren't able to provide for your family, then then there wasn't a reason for you to exist. Like it was very, very much so where people took pride in their ability and pride in their families and pride in their work. And and it was on them. It was on them. They needed to do better. It wasn't the fact that the country was going through complete and utter hell. It wasn't it wasn't any of that. It was because they needed to. They they were men and they should have done better. And yeah, I can't imagine 
being a man in these days. And I couldn't either. It it would have been so tough to to go day to day knowing that you're, you know, not able to do these things, not able to provide provide. Uh rugged undeveloped wilderness. They had to build their towns from the ground up. They didn't have as much trouble as y'all did surviving. Yeah, but this is this is after one. This isn't after two. Two hasn't happened yet. And um it was it was across the world. I mean, it was exacerbated by the fact that we had the the Dust Bowl and we had um we had union excuse me, union start coming into play. We had we had a lot of problems and a lot of issues. Like I said, you had the production, you had a bunch of war production, especially here in Detroit. We had this just massive war production that ramped up to to provide ammunition and tanks and equipment for for the troops. And then everybody got, you know, kind of happy and maybe relatively complacent. And then it just all goes away, just all goes away. Um, and you couldn't keep that many people employed. So uh, I see it. I see why it was difficult. It certainly would have been difficult. And we did have a lot of that where uh, people just went out west and, you know, and and did their thing. But, yeah. Some succumb to apathy. Some are swept by alarm. You also had, uh, I think it was Black Tuesday. It wasn't Black Monday. Maybe it was Black Tuesday. I forget where the stock market crashed. So so it affected everyone. It affected the farmers because of the dust bowl. It affected the industrial workers because of the wartime production and then it also affected everybody that was in the financial sectors or the the legal services or stuff like that so my mom's folks were farmers in oklahoma so they had the dust bowl on top of the depression yeah and that's what it was it wasn't just one thing it wasn't just oh we're having trouble on the great plains farming it's yeah, Spanish flu was in there. We just can't. There was a lot of things that happened all at once. And you get to the point where it's like, damn, this is a lot. And it was. It was the industrial production. It was the unions coming in. It was the the lack of farming in the United States. And then it was the the professional services, the lawyers, the the stock traders, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and it was it was a lot. And it was it was a lot all at once, and and the co- the country suffered for it. So, and bank after bank across the country is hit by panic withdrawals. New lines appear on American streets, depositors swarming to snatch out what savings they have left before it's too late. Banks by the hundreds, by the thousands, are forced to close. On the eve of the presidential election of 1932, the whole financial system quakes and totters. And we'll get into. Detroit did some interesting things in the thirties, the the mid thirties. Uh, like I said, this is kind of an overview of what kind of things are taking place in the thirties, and then we'll hit other points. So, a bitter electorate of frightened people turns overwhelmingly against the party in power, turns hopefully toward a new national leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> His campaign promise, a new deal. His campaign song, Happy Days Are Here Again. Uh, so I think it will go on after this, and I won't have to jump in every 30 seconds. But um, the new deal, so as, as helpful as it was, and I think probably it was the only way out that didn't involve civil war or conflict. It was incredibly damaging. It was incredibly damaging to our system of government. Our system of government was not set up for all the social entitlements. What's up, Lynn? Good to see you. Uh, not all, not for all the social entitlements. It wasn't set up for all the all the things that would come of it. Um, that that we still carry many of them because government programs never go away. They just build. <laughs> so, um, we we got a lot of that that socialist or that. Um, this is, I believe, around the time where the the saying "We're from the government, we're here to help," 
so uh yeah it's uh <laughs> i get i get both sides of that so franklin delano roosevelt on his inauguration day in the tension and antagonisms of the moment, the defeated president and the president-to-be barely speak as they ride together to the Capitol for the swearing-in ceremony. The day is overcast and sullen, shadowed by uncertainty in Washington and throughout the land. For America, something is ending this day. Something is beginning, and no man can tell what. One thing only is certain on this 4th of March, 1933. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. Hey, Dr. Butcher over on the Rumble. Welcome. From the 32nd president of the United States in his inaugural address come words that electrify a people desperate for hope and assurance. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Whatever may be said of him, this the people sense. He is not afraid. That night, the new president promptly breaks with tradition. He does not attend the inaugural ball. Instead, he launches immediately on a program of legislation and reform without precedent in American history. The New Deal begins at once. This nation, he has said, asks for action, and action now. Action begins next day, Sunday. With Secretary of the Treasury Wooden, the President orders every bank in the nation to close. The holiday begins in a holiday mood for most. But to assure the public that the banks will reopen safely, the president hits upon his most popular innovation, an informal report direct to the man on the street, the fireside chat. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. Hey, Bobby. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. <laughs> Now, every train to Washington brings its cargo of experts to join the great assault on the Depression. Economists, sociologists, statisticians, agronomists, idealists, world savers. Each with a pet panacea, a surefire system to save the country. Somebody writes a poem about it. Tramp, tramp, the grand old party's breaking camp. Blare of bugles, din, din. The New Deal is moving in. Along with master politicians like James Farley and Louis Howe, the president surrounds himself with bright young college professors, such as Raymond Moley, Rexford Guy Tugwell, and Adolph Burley, men who generate new ideas and new policies. They are the brain trust of the Roosevelt Revolution. Bill after bill pours into Congress from the White House. Whatever Roosevelt wants, he gets. The house is burning down, says the Republican floor leader. So give the president anything he needs to put out the fire. Through 100 historic days of a special session, every New Deal measure passes without question. Unprecedented power for a commander in chief. Um, and if we look at the time frame, there was some some checks put on it later. But then we see future presidents that abuse power to an unbelievable degree and this is where it started he got he got full uh unchecked power to do whatever he wanted um and again i think it was the right thing for the right time but it it sets up for future where you can use that 
if there's something like a crisis or if there's something like a pandemic or it just gives them when when we do this there's never the foresight to see that it will affect us 50 60 70 80 100 years in the future and that's how our system set up is once something is once something is given the green light there's no putting it back in the bottle that is now precedent and it will it will continue to be uh yeah fema yep so the country demands bold persistent experimentation the president says and the country gets it secretary yep. of agriculture henry wallace launches the aaa a program for managing and controlling america's farm resources the new secretary of the interior harold ickes administers the pwa a program of public works designed to create jobs for the unemployed the secretary of labor Frances perkins first woman cabinet member expert in employment problems an advocate of economic planning plus we got a lady in a cabinet problem you know i'm kidding y'all but uh Something like a war psychology grips Washington as the shakeup in government goes on night and day by headlong trial and error. Everything from federal theater projects to legalizing light wines and 3.2 beer. And an alphabetical avalanche of new offices and agencies. FERA, CCC, TVA. And we'll get into those the a lot. The most urgent measure in 1933 is NRA. A system of codes administered by General Hugh Johnson to regulate wages, hours, and employment. Even Will Rogers gets behind it. Hello. This is uh, this is taken in the, uh, in the uh, general part of General uh, Johnson's uh, NRA headquarters. I have been here all night and all the day working with him on. Uh, a comedian's code, code for comedian, and we've had quite an argument. He wants to include the senators and the congressmen in this, and I'm fighting against that uh, because us amateurs do not want to be classed with professionals. And I'm arguing with this guy Johnson, and he's tough, boy. He's tough, this fella. The thing has got to work. Uh, this whole NRA system has got to work or else. I mean, and, and, or they hey, Josh. Or else what? Oh, buddy. So just else they ain't going to be nothing if it don't work. So all America rallies round the Blue Eagle, the symbol of NRA, the National Recovery Act. Will it work? Will it spread employment and raise wages? Well, Hugh Johnson has no doubt. If every employer will live up to the code or to his agreement under which he got the Blue Eagle. Did he say Hugh Johnson? If every Johnson? consumer will buy under the Blue Eagle and buy generously now to the very full of his prudence needs, American business and employment will show the biggest spurt that it has known for years. And we are on our way out of this depression before snow flies. Okay, I, real talk. Who misses how men used to talk back in the day? Plus, you can see dude smoking behind him. That's that's not something you see today, uh, for better or worse. But the way that men used to talk used to have an edge to it. There used to be something more to it. Now you hear politicians talking. I just want to go to sleep. Like this, they had just more of a. There was more grit to them. There was more edge to them. I liked it kind of. Government by ballyhoo, some call it, and denounce NRA as national regimentation, alien to the American way. But most are caught up in the color and excitement of the times. Hasn't Roosevelt said, we are on our way and heading in the right direction? Linda just called me out and said I'm not a real man. I'm going to go to my cry closet now. All of them. <laughs> Prohibition passes out. 
At 35 and a half minutes past three on December 5th, 1933, Utah becomes the 36th state to ratify the 21st Amendment, repealing the 18th. Beer is back, not just 3.2, but real beer. Eight states remain dry, but in the other 40, what's yours? Anything goes. <laughs> Good night, Tigger. say what will happen before another morning rolls around. Things are going on all the time nowadays that would have seemed impossible a few years ago. Some people worry what effect all these changes and reforms will have in the long run. But the new dealers say people don't eat in the long run, they eat every day. So the changes keep coming. What's going to happen next? Allegedly. We don't know. We can't say. We're wondering. One thing that's happening, men are going to work for the government by the millions on new buildings, roads, schools, bridges, anything to get the forgotten man, as Roosevelt calls him, off the bread lines and on the job. Any job. WPA. It stands for Works Progress Administration, but critics say it really means we poke along. The boondoggling, the shovel leaning, becomes the target for anti-administration wits. <laughs> and against the most spectacular of New Deal projects, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, opponents charge unfair government competition with private business. But TVA generates cheap power for millions of homes and factories in a blighted area. It works and it grows. Few object to the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It takes thousands of young men out of the towns and cities where there is nothing for them to do and puts them in government camps where there is plenty to do. Work that conserves the soil and replenishes the forests. On the farmland, a paradox. The New Deal promises the more abundant life. But in the farm belt, abundance is a burden. Now, government agents go about preaching the gospel of crop control, the economics of scarcity. Farmers are paid not to plant. The AAA, the Agriculture Adjustment Act, seeks to bolster farm income by ordering crops plowed under. And millions of acres of wheat, cotton, corn are left unplanted. And we get a lot of that now. And we get a lot of that where farmers are paid not to grow crop just to just to continue these programs and a lot of these things were very short-sighted and again i i think there was no other way out at the time i really do but there were a lot of things that were so short-sighted that now have a major impact and will be issues and problems in the next round because because we're going to go through the next round here pretty pretty shortly um, and these are all challenges that we're going to have to, uh, yeah, that's true. Yep. So panel companies come up and buy along or buy up farmland. Yep. And, and I think that there's like a soft new deal or a soft Renaissance. And we've heard, uh, I forget what Biden calls it, but, or maybe it was, uh, heels up. Somebody called it something and it was, uh, basically that they were going to uh green new deal or whatever what was the general populace at that time irish english a lot of irish a lot of english um yeah a lot of uh i mean there was a, there was a lot of white europeans 
for the most part was was the makeup uh germans that kind of thing so and yet men are hungry that such measures are needed says secretary wallace is a shocking comment Italian. on our civilization but farm prices do go up farm income rises To the troubles man makes for himself in the 30s, nature adds disasters of her own. Hurricanes, floods, drought. Steinbeck tells the tale that is told of the Okies, and he calls it the Grapes of Wrath. They took the migrant way to the west. In the daylight, they scuttled like bugs to the westward, and as the dark caught them, they clustered like bugs near to shelter and to water. And because they were lonely and perplexed, because they had all come from a place of sadness and worry and defeat, and because they were all going to a new mysterious place, they huddled together. They talked together. They shared their lives. They were not farm men anymore, but migrant men. The voice of the demagogue is heard in the land. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. With his rabble-rousing shout of share the wealth, he makes his bid to become dictator of America. The Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, Communism. Father Charles E. Coughlin, Dr. Francis E. Townsend. Together and on their own, they woo the frustrated and bewildered with slogans and panaceas. Dr. Townsend calls... That guy looked very German. Sorry. Sorry, Alex. ...his patented cure-all, the old age... Re that guy looks very German. I don't know if he is. Revolving pension plan, and he claims five million followers. The radio priest, Father Coughlin, wins a growing following by scoffing at democracy and playing on racial prejudice. Thousands of Americans, fearful of the expanding threat of communism from the radical left, turn in their anxiety to the extreme right. <laughs> The Reverend Gerald Smith falls heir to the Share the Wealth movement when a political enemy murders Huey Long. I always talk loud, says the Reverend Gerald Smith, and too many come to listen and believe. It can't happen here, the saying goes. He kind of, this guy kind of looks like an Austrian painter that was also rising to power about the same time. So there was a mere, a mere system and, uh, yeah, certain Austrian painter we all know and love. <laughs> the gesticulating, yeah. I mean, people think you're nuts if you did something like that today. I don't. It's it's different. It's different. But but no, for real. I mean, you, you see a lot of similarities with the the Socialist Party in Germany at the same time that similar things were happening here and had a lot of support. So. But it seems to be. From Hyde Park on the Hudson, a different voice. Franklin Roosevelt relaxes with his wife and grandchildren at his ancestral home. Out of this patrician background has come his sweeping program of social security and reform, a lifetime in public service. Despite inherited wealth and privileged position, he has somehow acquired the common touch that endears him to the common man. A personal magnetism and inner buoyancy have smoothed his path in politics. Once he said to Orson Welles, you and I are the two best actors in America. His second home is Warm Springs, Georgia, where he finds relief in the mineral waters. Infantile paralysis deprived him of the use of his legs at the age of 39. The President of the United States 
is the first man in history to achieve world stature without the ability to walk. His affliction, says his wife Eleanor, gave him strength and courage he had not had before. But though a cripple, he is no invalid. At Warm Springs, he becomes Dr. Roosevelt and frolics with his fellow victims whom he calls my gang. We are going to make it a crusade, says Roosevelt of his campaign for re-election in 1936. Though major New Deal measures like NRA and AAA have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, millions of men have been put to work, and the National Business Index has almost doubled. All Look across at that the land, beautiful the president is hailed as a gay crusader who has led his nation out of the economic wilderness without... De Did they just say he's a gay crusader? I think they did. Dictatorship or revolution. To the many who feel that happy days are here again, he is FDR, yes. the champ. A counter crusade rolls across the country led by the Republican candidate Alp M. Landon, able governor of Kansas, successful oil man, middle of the road conservative. For him and for many, the basic campaign issue is that of governmental power and its abuse. He says, The question raised for this issue, what power the might. government shall have and what power well, there were adult shall girls. have can be the difference between representative government and an organized authority wielded by one man. Against that one man, that man in the White House, the Republicans charge that he is destroying the American way of life, that he is leading the country down the road to socialism, that he is Franklin Deficit Roosevelt, whose spending has increased the public debt by billions. Let's make it a Landon slide. Increased, increased the debt by billions, if they only knew what trillions were back then. 34 of them. Damn. Election night, 1936. Roosevelt takes every state in the Union but Maine and Vermont and wins huge majorities in both houses of Congress. It is the greatest political sweep in history. During his campaign, the president said, this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. The United States, moving toward that destiny, enters the second term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So, that is a little bit about what was going on in the 1930s. Also, in the 1930s, uh, officially in 1928, but it actually starts in the 1930s. And in honor of their fantastic season, uh, I know everybody's favorite's not sports ball, but this was this was a big deal for Detroit. Um, 1930, the Detroit franchise started as the Portsmouth. Spartans in 1930. Detroit radio executive George A. Richards purchased the Spartans in 1934 and moved them to Detroit, where they were renamed the Detroit Lions. So, uh, thank you. It was a good season. So, oh, stop. So, this is kind of a uh, History of the Lions, and we'll probably not go. We'll see how far we get, but. Our story begins in 1928, when a collection of players from defunct, independent, semi-professional, and professional football teams formed together to create the Portsmouth, Ohio Spartans. In 1929, the team was granted know. funding to build a new stadium capable of hosting professional Dude, games. Dollars. And in July of 1930, the National Football League would grant Portsmouth, Ohio, and their shiny new stadium, a franchise. Portsmouth would become the NFL's second smallest host city, only ahead of Green Bay. In the Spartans' inaugural season, the team went 5-6-3, and three, finishing 7th place out of 11 teams in the NFL. But by 1932, 
the Spartans were tied for first place in the NFL, including an impressive win over the defending NFL champion Green Bay Packers. The Spartans won 19-0 in what was dubbed the Iron Man game, as the head coach Patsy Clark didn't make a single substitution all game. All of this culminated to what would be deemed the first playoff game in NFL history, as the Spartans faced off against the Chicago Bears, both of which were tied for first place in the league. The Bears would ultimately win that game 9-0. However, despite the early success from the product on the field, the Spartans as a franchise was in trouble financially. The team was unable to pay its players and the small market was not able to keep the team afloat. Enter George A. Richards, the owner of the Detroit radio station WJR, who in 1934 purchased the Portsmouth Spartans for $8,000 and moved the team to Detroit. George A. Richards would name the team the Detroit Lions. Richards had a dream to build a team that reflected the Lions as the king of the jungle, as he believed his football team was good enough to be the king of the NFL. But like all dreams, there you go. it can only last so long. And That's eventually, why. you have to wake up. The inaugural season of the Detroit Lions could not have started any better. The 1934 season began with a 10-game win game streak. Back then, However, sure. the team would go on to lose their last three games and therefore finish in second place in the division. Two of those three losses coming to the Green Bay Packers and Chicago Bears, rivals from the very beginning. Owner George Richards would also use his media connections to negotiate a deal with ABC Eagles? to broadcast his Lions on Is Thanksgiving Day, which would help solidify the tradition of the Lions on Thanksgiving. To learn more about that, you can check out my deep dive special on the subject. Anyways, along with a national audience and immediate success, the Lions continued to burst onto the scene in their second season, winning the division and winning the NFL championship 26-7 against the New York Giants. The following seasons, the team would finish with records of 8-4, 7-4, and 7-4 and 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 again, but never finished better than second place in the awesome. division, I've never finding heard of themselves that. behind either the Packers or Bears. Following 1938, Lions greats quarterback Dutch Clark and running back Ernie Cadell both retired and left a massive void of talent to fill. As a result, the team entered a decade of uncertainty and an inevitable drop-off. The team saw a win-loss records ranging from 7-3 all the way to the dreaded 0-11. In fact, that 0-11 team was so bad that it never scored more than 7 points in a game all season <laughs> and were shut out 5 times. The struggling Lions also featured the, so far, last instance of a scoreless tie in NFL history. But the decade was also home to reasons for hope, as the team rebuilt their roster and made moves for young stars. In fact, many considered the roster to be mostly championship ready, with the only thing missing being a franchise quarterback. In 1950, that would all change and bring on a decade of unseen prosperity. The Lions would trade, get this, a fullback, Camp Wilson, for quarterback Bobby Lane of the New York Yanks. Oh, Bobby how Lane. the times have changed. A fullback for a quarterback. That would be absurd in today's NFL. Either way, as funny as that trade sounds, from today's standards, it turned out to be the missing piece for the Detroit Lions. We'll see if they talk about it. Um, Barry Winless. Okay. Yeah, we might go through the whole thing just because I'm interested too. But uh, so Bobby Lane, the curse of Bobby Lane, um, he said the Lions won't win again for 50 years. And and we didn't. We we didn't <laughs> ever since Bobby left. Um, Matthew Stafford was supposed to break the curse because Matthew was went to the same high school as Bobby Lane. A whole bunch of lore there. He obviously didn't. Um, but yeah, scoreless tie in the NFL. That's crazy. Defense was a lot more important back then. Who improved to 7 4 and 1 in Lane's first season under center, followed by a 9 and 3 record in 1952, <laughs> which led the team to the playoffs for the first time in 17 years. They would defeat the Los Angeles Rams in the National Conference Championship and move on to face Paul Brown's Cleveland Browns for the first of four championship meetings between the two teams throughout the decade. The Detroit Lions would take home the first matchup 17-7. They followed that up with an absolutely dominant 1953 season from start to finish. It began with a team selecting future Hall of Fame linebacker Joe Schmidt in the seventh round of the draft and then going 10-2 in the season sweeping the Bears and the Packers in four consecutive weeks. That squad would finish with seven Pro Bowlers and eight All-Pros, 
And to put the cherry on top, won the championship 17 to 16 over the Cleveland Browns. In 1954, the Lions would go 9, 2, and 1 and meet the Browns for the third year in a row in the championship game. However, this time, Paul Brown would get his revenge with a 56 to 10 stomping. The stunned Lions would stumble to a three win season in 1955, but bounce back to 9 and 3 in 1956 and a first place finish at 8 and 4 in 1957. The Lions were back in the playoffs after a two year gap and would face off against the San Francisco 49ers. But by halftime, the home team 49ers had taken a 24 7 lead over the Lions. Was this Lions team actually a fluke? Did they not deserve to return to the playoffs? I mean, after all, their starting quarterback, Bobby Lane, was out with injury and the team was relying on backup Tobin Rote. Well, the thin walls at halftime provided all the motivation they needed. Through the wall, they could hear a celebrating 49ers team that believed they had already won the game based on the score. The teams would come out in halftime and the 49ers would score a field goal on the opening drive. However, that would be the last points they scored for the remainder of the game. The Lions backup quarterback led the team to a 24 unanswered point comeback to win 31 to 27 and send the Lions to the championship game. The team may Huh, it's kind of what happened just last weekend, but the other way around. We were up big at half, and, and, huh. Good face would be, of course, the Cleveland Browns, the team that had shell-shocked them just two years prior. But backup quarterback Tobin Rote and the Lions were fed up and returned to the favor with a 59-14 domination you over the Browns. It, it would be their third championship in six years, in four in their first 28 years of existence. The Lions and their fan base were at the pinnacle of their success, a feeling of redemption and pure bliss. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of this journey, all dreams do come to an end. And this... And actually, I just thought... I just reminded myself what comes after 58 so we're good but uh yeah so that's how the Detroit Lions got started um then they were absolutely horrific uh and still have not made a Super Bowl but it's interesting that 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 championship game or NFC championship game before it was the NFC but we played uh San Francisco and it uh Niners are known for it at times, sending out their cheerleaders out in the second half. <laughs> um, neat. Uh, so that that's pretty much the exact thing that happened this week. So that's uh, this last weekend. Um, big halftime lead, score flips, and and close to the same score. So, but of course, it's it's not fixed or anything. Nah. Um. So we start growing. Or we have been growing. We've been growing up to this point every every time we do a census or do a kind of a a look at our population. So in nineteen thirty in Detroit there are one million five hundred and sixty eight thousand six hundred and sixty two according to the nineteen thirty US census conducted by Census Bureau one month from April first, nineteen thirty, determine the residents population in the United States at that time was 122,775,046 and that was an increase of 13.7% over the 1920 census so we're still that sucks yeah we still have not made it to a Super Bowl so we've never made it to a Super Bowl we won the 1958 NFL Championship which is the last NFL championship. We've just never made it to a Super Bowl. Um, what's up, Jacob Castro? So, this next one, I'm going to say this word, and I think I'm making a bigger deal out of it. I just want to be sure if you're, if you're sensitive. Uh, the Negro Leagues, which is still what they're called. It's the politically correct term. Don't cancel me. Um, so in 1930, the first night game in Detroit at newly built Hamtramck Stadium was the Negro League Detroit Stars and the Kansas City Monarchs. So integration was not in baseball. That wasn't until later with Jackie Robinson. Uh, we obviously had the Tigers. The Tigers won a World Series in 35. They won a, uh, They were pretty competitive. But 
the Negro Leagues are starting to come into the scene and starting to have uh, starting to have baseball here in Detroit. Um, so this is uh, Midstream Grip. Make sure you have liked this stream. Also check to see if you're still subscribed. So this is uh, next one up is a little bit about history of the Negro Leagues. Blacks playing baseball was not a new phenomenon. We've been playing baseball since slavery and Negro. has been traced all the way back to no, the living in roots. So this game, which has been held as America's national pastime, certainly has been embedded in the hearts of African American and people of dark color skin for a long time. Is it getting better? Do you feel safe? Oh, I probably misspelled it then. Will it make it easier on you now? You got someone to play. These athletes were so passionate about the game of baseball that they were willing to endure whatever social adversity confronted them as they traveled the highways and byways of our country just to play baseball. And to be fair, they had absolute absolute shit for uh buses and stuff like that it wasn't uh it wasn't like the previous um yeah the the buses the hotels the the stopovers i did i did print or i did spell it nergo didn't i uh my apologies um but yeah we'll keep going with this don't care. Early references of blacks playing baseball go back to slavery. There being games played amongst the slaves back into the 1800s. After we became free, baseball really became a passion, and not only as a pastime, but as an opportunity to play this game professionally. <laughs> Moses Fleetwood Walker would ultimately become the first known black to play on an all-white professional team. Didn't last very long, however, before the movement that would basically say, if you allow black to play with you, you can't play with us. A gentleman's agreement. Amazingly, there was never anything written. There were men and women who were as American as anyone, going to war, fighting the same kind of racism in other countries that we were being asked to accept at home. The sentiment was simple. If they can die fighting for their country, they ought to be able to play baseball in this country. The architect of black baseball really was Ruth Foster. You see, Foster created the style of play that became signature in Negro League baseball. Very fast, very aggressive, very daring. It would be Ruth who was credited with inventing the screwball. Night baseball originated in the Negro Leagues some five years before they played a night game in the Major Leagues. The first professional night baseball game took place in 1930 in Lawrence, Kansas, and it featured our very own Kansas City Monarchs. J.L. Wilkinson, who owned the Monarchs, literally mortgaged everything he had to pioneer night baseball. He was looking for a way to get the working class fan into the ballpark. Night baseball became the answer. Gibson and the great Buck Leonard. They certainly were Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig uh, of the Negro Leagues. Thunder and Lightning, as they were known. Leonard, classic line drive, hit a great first base when he was compared to Lou Gehrig. Gibson was incredible. In 1936, he's credited with having hit 84 home runs in a single season hit a ball in the polo grounds that was estimated to have traveled some 600 feet. He is still believed to be the only man to hit a ball completely out of Yankee Stadium. When you think about baseball and you think about Satchel Page in particular, he really epitomizes what the athlete in the Negro Leagues was like, the superstar athlete in the Negro Leagues. Satchel Page, of course, one of the highest paid baseball players in the history of the sport. I called him the game's first free agent because he literally sold his services to the highest bidder. The great orchestra leader, Lionel Hampton, absolutely adored the Monarchs. Lena Horn throwing out the first pitch at an all-star game. The legendary Cab Calloway had his own semi-pro black baseball team. 
And interestingly enough, all the jazz musicians wanted to be baseball players. All the baseball players wanted to be jazz musicians. So it was only <laughs> fitting that they would come together here at 18th and Vine, where you had the best of both worlds, jazz and baseball. In 1945, Jackie Robinson left Fort Riley, Kansas, where he had served in the United States Army to become a member of the great Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues. He would spend one season with the Monarchs, primarily as a second baseman, and at the end of the 45 season, would sign his contract to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Robinson was certainly the best prepared to deal with the racial hatred that he would be confronted with. Did I disappoint you? He had been a celebrated collegian at UCLA, he had played with and against white athletes. He had served in the military. He was disciplined. He was married. He was stable. You see, when Jackie Robinson stepped to the plate, he was oftentimes knocked down. When he would slide in the second base, he would come up wet where the opposition had spit on him. They did everything imaginable to break Jackie, but Jackie was not great. When you think about the fact that he's literally carrying 21 million African Americans on his shoulders when he walks across those lines. You know, it's just absolutely amazing to see how baseball and social advancement really became parallel in our society. And many of the great changes that we have seen occur in this country occurred as a result of the great game of baseball. All right, we don't need to hear the the woke angle of it. It, it was obviously very shitty. Um, just you're playing a game. If whoever's the best, go out and go out and play baseball. Like it's 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 kind of ridiculous that uh we went through that kind of stuff all the way up until the end of the 40s early part of the 50s um and then even beyond obviously uh completely unnecessary and and missed out on probably some good people uh some good athletes and in different sports and games and just in general um it was hard and they went through they went through absolute bullshit and if you're if you're into looking into that kind of stuff the the negro leagues and uh talking about some of the stuff that they went through just getting to cities and the mistreatment and stuff like that it it really is a it's an interesting thing what they did to pay baseball you always hated watching baseball playing it it's crazy fun i like to play baseball um I was good at baseball too, but watching it's tough. I can do it every once in a while if Tigers are in something, but uh, for the most part, I I can't do a whole lot of baseball. So baseball is for heart patients because nothing exciting happens until it does, then it then it goes. Um. So so yeah, it was it was unfortunate what happened to people that were just trying to play a game. And had to be treated like that. So, uh, so moving from one racial tension issue to the next. Uh, 1930, Elijah Muhammad forms the Nation of Islam in Detroit. So, uh, a little bit back, we we heard about the the Jews moving in, and then we started hearing about all the other racial and ethnic groups, and then now we have. The Nation of Islam is prevalent here in Detroit. A lot of them eventually moved out to Dearborn, uh, just west of the the city, Um, but also a big, uh, big impact. So women's lacrosse is fun to watch. It's like uh, women's... uh, Volleyball. You're watching it for the wrong reason, Josh. So, uh, that was important in the history of the the establishment of the Nation of Islam in Detroit. Uh, 1932, we had the Hunger March. 
So this was kind of nuts. Um, this was a little bit of the tension between the uh, between the individuals and because of the Great Depression, uh, it led to what they call the Ford Massacre. It led to some... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yep, it is. Diving, you know, any of those. Uh, <laughs> so this was really kind of Detroit experiencing those pains of all the things that were going on, the, the socioeconomic things, the depression, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so the Ford Hunger March was an actual event that occurred on March 7th, 1932. In a protest over the lack of jobs, unemployed workers marched from the western Detroit border to the Ford Motor Company's giant River Rouge industrial complex in Dearborn. So we've talked about River Rouge. It is a city within a city. It is Ford's major manufacturing plant. We've actually done the in previous episodes. We've done both the River Rouge tour from this time frame and the River Rouge tour today. That they uh, with the robotics and the advanced manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, River Rouge is really important. Uh, it was a hunger march, not a hunger strike. So it wasn't like tie you to the it wasn't like the tie you to the pole and and not eat because somebody's not giving you something. This was, damn, we are hungry and we're going to die if we don't get some food. And to get food, we're going to need jobs because they actually worked for things back then and didn't just go in and, and swipe everything. Um, so they weren't asking for anything but jobs. They wanted jobs so that they could care for their family. They weren't smashing up things and stealing. I, I mean, some of that did happen after the riot started. Um, we'll get into another one that happens later. But it wasn't like today where you go loot an entire mall because you supposedly need to feed your child or your family, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll watch the next one. Yes. Yes, they did still have family units back then, and both parents were in the household, and blah, blah, blah. Nope, no asphalt, no pictures, no nothing. Um, They just wanted jobs. Uh, but this is the Ford Massacre, the hunger strike, the march, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll go through this one. By the bitter cold and snow, unemployed workers from auto and other industries marked the grand circus of art of the city of David Bourbon. It's a marking grand circus. Grand Circus Park is not a circus. It's just a park in the middle of Detroit. Executive Hoover and Mayor Murphy 
starvation over. Militant leader speaks out against hunger. Four guards and local police attack unemployed workers with clubs, tear gas, and guns at the Fort Rouge. So it got really messy and it got really bad. Four young leaders were murdered. They ask for food and jobs. And not the handouts and free shit. They for food and jobs. And they got bullets. Smashboard Murphy Police Terror. That's a good time. Protests held in New York and other cities against the murder of unemployed. And realistically, the government is probably like, eh, well, if they're dead, they can't, uh, don't have to worry about them anymore. Oh, me? Sorry, I'm trying to read as it's going. The struggle continues for unemployment relief for jobs. Plus, it's a little fuzzy. There's like a little bit of fuzz. Hopefully that's better. Uh, for freedom of all political prisoners. There's like a heavy fuzz that was coming through. So it was... Uh, I'm wondering if that was it or if you still can't hear me. Better? Okay. Build the auto workers union. And so that was the first real push too for the unions to start moving. 
so well yeah that must have been what it was it was just there's like a heavy buzzing to the old film so um so it was it was probably difficult so i apologize for that uh but yeah so they they marched they wanted jobs they wanted to work they wanted to provide for their family and and that's all that they cared about they didn't care about anything but an honest day's work going to do their thing and and so on and so forth um so it's unfortunate it's unfortunate um but it was a tough time and and again the industrial work in the cities were not something that had a lot of uh had a lot of opportunity at the time so um unfortunately that's that's what happens so uh, and then we will go on to this is supposed to be 32 and I was going to change it. But then I said, yeah, we'll just tell you uh, 1932 Detroit's electric streetcar system peaks in size with 30 lines stretching 534 total miles. Um, so electric streetcars were the preferred method. There is a conspiracy theory that that went away because of Ford Motor Company. Um. And that's why we don't have mass transit in Detroit. The best we have is the Q. The Q is shit. It goes down Woodward. It has like three stops. Probably more than that. But there's like three usable stops. And it just goes straight down Woodward and back. Before that, we had the Detroit People Mover. I don't know if it's still up. Um, but we'll get to that later. But this was the original mass transit. This was the original transit for the city of Detroit. And this was the peak of that system. So, uh, and I think they were pretty cool. We all have our favorite memories of Detroit, whether it's the department stores. They were like mini trains. Or the movie theaters. I feel like that's the so loud. Or even the ice cream fountains. But what connects us to all these places might be what connected them in the past. The streetcars. I remember about the streetcars that cost six cents for ride, and the transfer was one penny. <laughs> one penny. You had to run out to the center island to get out of thing and avoid all the cars, just getting out to where you boarded the thing. Then the thing would take off, and they had kind of a direct drive. So when they floored the things, I mean, they'd throw you backwards. They were fast, and when they got going, everybody got out of their way. They're really fun with the bells clanging and the sparks flying off the top. The uh, politeness of the conductor, the brass um, gleaming in the daytime and in the early twilight, the ding, ding, ding of the bell. It was like going on an adventure every time you got on one in the beautiful gleaming glass. I mean, they were just very elegant. As you got closer to the downtown area, once you passed the David Whitney building, you had Russics and you had Grinnells. You had DJ Healy's. God, it looks so much different. They had Seagulls. Frank and Cedars used to be on Woodward Avenue. There was one restaurant called The Ambassador that made the greatest grilled cheese sandwich you ever wanted to eat. It was an open-faced grilled cheese sandwich. Damn. You don't think a grilled cheese is so unusual, but theirs was unusual. I hate grilled cheese, by the way. The neat thing was it went all the way, if you stayed on the Woodward car, went all the way out to 8 Mile Road and turned around right at the city limits and i remember riding them just for the fun of it because i was such a streetcar fanatic at the time just got on a ride out there go out ride back just to be riding on the things i never thought of the streetcars as romantic or wonderful until i found out that they were going to disappear and uh, my children were very young when the, when they took the last woodward cars off the line so I think we went down and uh, everybody got a ride on the streetcar. I'm not sure they remember that very much, but I sure do.
It has been suggested that when we reflect upon the past, we enlarge what is no longer there. Could the giant stove in Hudson Flag really be that big? Were summers at Jefferson Beach and ice skating on Belle Isle really more fun back then? Was music really sweeter at the Vanity or in the Valley? In the final analysis, perhaps it is not the places or things that count the most. In Olympia. The Maybe it's the people with whom we shared the good times, our families, our friends, or even complete strangers. Thank you for sharing. All right. We're not we're not going to go through this right now, but I despise grilled cheese. I I will throw it on the floor. I hate grilled cheese. Hate it with a passion. It's one of the things I hate the most on, on this planet. If somebody nuked every grilled cheese for the rest of my life, I would be totally content with it. With that being said, um, I totally missed something, and it wasn't in any of the research, and I thought it came later, um, and I guess the other one did, so I'm going to take that back and not say anything because um, I was doing more research, and I'm like, well, shit, it's right there, so it has to have already been there. So, you'll find out later, because I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, maybe I'll go down there. Maybe I'll make that part of my trip when I go down there. You guys are like, what the, what the hell are you talking about? Well, you'll find out. No, just any grilled cheese, anything at all. I just, nope, I'm out. I'm out. Uh, so, part of the New Deal program was the FF, FHLB. In 1932, the Federal Home Loan Bank Act was passed. This act served to form Federal Home Loan Bank Board, which supervised loan institutions and lower the overall ownership cost of home overall cost of home ownership. If I can say that, Ugh, sorry. Um, so there were a lot of these federal programs, as we'll get to, and we'll see a little bit more as we go on. Um, a lot of them, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different programs. And actually, I'm going to, I didn't think I was going to, but I'm going to, because that makes more sense if I just do it that way. Um, so we'll go to 12. Another one of those in 1933. People actually knew grilled cheese. They should. They should. They should. Uh, and I just lost like four viewers. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was sponsored by the grilled cheese mafia. My apologies. Uh, formation of the homeowners, homeowners loan corporation established part of the new deal. This group mainly served to help refinance home mortgages that faced a risk of foreclosure due to the 1929 economic crash and the housing industry collapse. So this was another thing. And, it was used for some good and some nefarious purposes because uh, it there was a lot of exclusion to African Americans and other racial groups that took place uh, during. So this was not this was not a great thing overall. Um, but but it led to something that I think is pretty cool and did not know before I started doing research into this. Um, and I ordered some, so hopefully it comes at some point, but there was a bank run at the end of 32, beginning of 33 and the following years, there was so there was a buyback of gold. The gold reserve was taken off. Um, there was a lot of things taken out of circulation. So, uh, there wasn't a, you just couldn't. So in 1933, the following years proved so draconian that 1933, Detroit city government was forced to meet payroll with script, a substitute for real money. Detroit printed its own greenbacks, authentic looking bills that still circulate today. Oh, that's even worse, Josh. Um, so Detroit started printing its own money. It says, uh, it's one of the articles that I read to, to find it. 
leading the city during one of its darkest hours was an empathetic guide, Mayor Frank Murphy, the former recorder's court judge who would go on to serve as Michigan Governor, U.S. Attorney General, and U.S. Supreme Court Justice. During his tenure, Murphy saw his role similar to that of President Franklin Roosevelt. Intimately attuned to the plight of the unemployed, Murphy established a new mayor's unemployment committee that would set up soup kitchens and vegetable gardens to serve needy people. Murphy even dined with jobless men at free food sites. Uh, Detroit also had a welfare department, one of the few municipal agencies in the nation. In 1932, the department assisted homeless families by placing them in vacant homes owned by the city. The support was urgently needed, according to the Free or the Free Press. By the summer of 1932, landlords threatened some 100 tenants per day with eviction. Massive layoffs at each of the Detroit automakers made the city situation especially acute. 80% of Detroit's manufacturing capacity stood idle. By 1933, Michigan's jobless late rate stood at 34%, while Detroit's rate of tax delinquencies was at the highest in the nation. Amid the final carnage, Roosevelt took Michigan in a landslide in 1932, making FDR the first Democrat to steer carried the state since Franklin Pierce in 1852. Determined to respond with bold action, the new president also saw his role as a counselor to the nation. So, as the Depression wore on, Detroiters in early 1990, or 1933 began to withdraw from their accounts to tie themselves over the first National Bank of Detroit was forced to honor some $250 million in withdrawals in 1933. That is insane. Uh, collectively, as much as $3 million a week was flowing from the city's financial institutions, which included the Guardian National Bank of Commerce and the Union Guardian Trust. If these institutions were to fail, experts believe the remaining, in banks, remaining banks in Michigan and would cascade to failing the entire nation would soon follow. So, two hundred and fifty million. Let's do the let's do the uh, inflation calculator. Let's see. So let's do. 1933, where are you? Oh, well, let me do 10 million. So we'll just have to... Sorry. Uh, so let's do 10 million and we'll just... 10 million. So 10 million at that time would be 237,787,596 and 90 cents. So if we extrapolate that out, uh, so 237,787,596 million at 90 cents times 2.5. So the money that was paid out was uh, $594,468,992.25. So that's a lot of money. A lot of money. Uh, so, of course, they needed to do something different. An emergency measure, Michigan Governor William Comstock declared a state bank holiday at 1 a.m. on February 14th, intended. The first last only eight days. It was extended to March 6th. So it lasted a lot longer than eight days. On that date, newly inaugurated Roosevelt, alarmed at panic withdrawals nationwide, imposed a national bank holiday, which remained in effect till March 13th. 
So for a month, they couldn't access banks. These measures put on pause all banking activity, avoiding potentially disastrous bank runs until a permanent solution could be found. While the bank holidays allowed institutions to avert insolvency, they were left with a huge problem. How were people su supposed to survive without access to their cash? Uh, the solution was one of last resort, Scrip, also known as promissory notes that would circulate as an alternative medium of exchange. Uh, so basically they're promissory notes and this is what one looks like. Uh, so they're promising when the bank reopened that you could get your $20. Um, City script accepted for room meals. Um, so, I mean, there was a lot of the Hudson Company was allowing them. There was a lot of people uh, that were that were using these. Um, they were issued from denominations to one from one dollar to one thousand dollars, and and they were used in lieu of money because no one had money because you couldn't get to the bank at all. Would I eat a grilled pizza? Maybe. I don't know that I wouldn't. Aren't all pizzas grilled? I don't know. Potentially. So, uh, I think it's kind of cool. I, I looked into it. Um, I'm going to grab me some City of Detroit money. As soon as it gets here. Uh, but just kind of a neat premise and a decent solution to a problem. I mean, it had to be reconciled when the banks opened up. Uh, but they they essentially made their own money that could be used to, you know, make make other money when everything opened back up. So, all right. So, Detroit has its own money. <laughs> Pizza are baked in an oven. That's what I figured. No, wait. I don't know what you're talking about, Dazzer. I'm moving on. Uh, the Detroit Industry Murals. We talked about this when we talked about the Detroit Institute of Arts a while back. Uh, this is one of the big things. It's on the wall in the main hall. But Diego Rivera. Uh, Detroit Industry Murals, 1932-33, are a series of frescoes by the Mexican artist Diego Rivera, consisting of 27 panels depicting industry at the Ford Motor Company and in Detroit. Together, they surround the interior Riviera Court at the Detroit Institute of Arts, painted between 1932 and 33. They were considered by Riviera to be his most successful work. They're beautiful. Um, I've seen them in person. They're, they're massive beautiful um hang on uh and of course Riviera was a, a hardcore political activist so so this is a little bit about Diego Rivera. Rivera? 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 In 1886, Diego Rivera was born in Guanajuato, Mexico. He was a painter with a reputation for incredible large scale murals. Diego Rivera was a student at the Academy of San Carlos in Mexico City. Later, he traveled to Europe to study abroad. Doing this inspired him immensely, as he became influenced by the craftsmanship of the old masters. In addition, he was also captivated by the Surrealist and Cubist movements. In 1921, 
Rivera returned to Mexico and began his memorable involvement in the Mexican mural movement. Artists used this movement as a tool to push for political and social change. Rivera often used his imagery to convey stories from Mexican history as well. He used his art to depict the realistic slice of life moments of the people in the working class. And to top it off, Rivera often accented his artwork with imagery and symbols from Mexican mythology and folk art. Often, many criticized Rivera's work for being too political. However, his art and their messages lived on and became influential to many artists to come. His depictions of real life people during his time not only served as social commentary on the lives of the people around him, but now serve as artistic documentation of history and what life was like for many who were highlighted in his murals. In 1957, Diego Rivera died in Mexico City. Okay, that's all I wanted out of that one. Um, so uh, here is the actual photo, uh, and it's it's kind of hard to see because it's a it's a rather large mural, but the just the details. So it's it's meant for Detroit industry, and you can see kind of the working line and and all that good stuff. Uh, but incredibly detailed, gorgeous paintings, um, and huge. Very, very large. So, um, and it kind of pisses me off because I looked, I looked and looked and looked for this video and couldn't find it. It was private everywhere, but I found it when I was bringing up the picture. So, good for us. So that's what it looks like in the Detroit Institute of Arts in that atrium. So. We're at the Detroit Institute of Arts in Rivera Court, which is where Diego Rivera's world-renowned Detroit industry murals are. It's the heart of the museum. There's some really We're very cool, proud uh, of this, and it inspires artists from down Detroit the way there. and around the world. Rivera came here in the early 1930s, and the only requirement was that it was about Detroit and Detroit's industry. So he went to the Ford River Rouge plant, which is a suburb of Detroit, and he was fascinated. He was fascinated by the machinery, by the rhythm. But what he also did was put a lot of his own views in. The men on the line were all ethnicities and races, according to Rivera, but in reality, it wasn't like that at all. He was commissioned actually by Edsel Ford, who was a modern art collector. And needless to say, Henry Ford, his father, was not very happy because he was pretty conservative. I'm he not a drawer, this wall. You see a man with a ruler, <laughs> and he's a composite of Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. So he symbolizes the man who is stern and, you know, always listening and watching. Also on that wall, you have war planes that were used for destruction, poison mm -hmm. gas manufacture that mutated cells. And on the other side, you have the worker who just happens to have a red star on his glove and a hammer in his hand. So the dichotomy of industry being good and evil is here. You see a group of people who are being given a tour of the, the plant, so they're watching the workers. And Rivera thought, oh, this is the bourgeoisie, they don't have to work, they have all this leisure time. So he patterned some of them after comic book characters. So you'll see Dick Tracy, you'll see the Cats and Jammer Kids, and then Charlie Chan. So in, in his own way, he's making fun of them. And then on this wall, he considered agriculture the first industry. So he has a baby being born out of the earth. And then on I either agree. side, the he has street, but the politics are asked. that are native to Michigan. So it, everything really comes out of the earth. And there was a right-wing priest, Father Conklin, who had a radio show that called for the murals to be whitewashed because he said that was blasphemous and he thought the nudity was pornographic. But actually, the administration of the museum and Edsel Ford and the workers all rallied behind it. So we're very fortunate that this, which really is his best work, remains the, the heart of the DIA and a wonderful symbol for Detroit. It is a really pretty picture. I've, I've seen it in person a couple times and it's it's gorgeous and there's a lot there, a lot to, a lot to kind of take in. Um, and a lot that I didn't even know. So uh, while we're reading about it. So if you ever get a chance, it's in the Detroit Institute of Arts down by Wayne State. And it's it's gorgeous. So 
Uh, so that takes us to the the next clash between Ford Motor Company and uh, the workers and stuff like that. And and we get into we're gonna start. Uh, well, we'll just yeah, let's start here. So this is just a quick overview about the riots, and then we'll get directly into the Battle of the Overpass. So. <laughs> Four days of rioting, looting, and arson rocked the city of Detroit in the worst outbreak of urban racial violence this year. Entire blocks of homes become infernos. At least 36 are killed, more than 2,000 injured, and damage topped the half billion mark. Damn, look at that fire truck. Governor Romney declares a state of emergency, requests federal troops, and 5,000 paratroopers reinforce the National Guard, state, and city police. The city's industry and business are severely affected. And a tight curfew is ordered in the motor center. A besieged city of guerrilla warfare. Sniper groups use day and night hit and run tactics before tanks move in to curb their window and rooftop barrage. Wreckage is everywhere. Shit, that's the wrong one. That's nine, That's 67. That's why it was up. I was like, why are there two videos? Never mind. Forget about that. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So that was a 67 one. So that one's for a, a future video. My my apologies. Um, I was like, I don't know why I have two up. And that was my confusion. But uh, anyways, uh, so forget, forget that. 1937, the Battle of the Overpass was attacked by the Ford Motor Company against the United Auto Workers on May 26, 1937 at the River Rouge Complex. There it is again in Dearborn, Michigan. So now we're going to actually go to the video that I meant to bring up because I totally messed that up. And this is the Battle of the Overpass. Harry Bennett, Walter Ruther, and the Ford Motor Company. And this is pre-unionization. So there were unions, but there wasn't a big push to unionize. There wasn't a lot of employees, wasn't a lot of workers. Um, the plants opened back up in like 1935, 1936, that territory. So the plants had been open for about a year. Wages weren't the same before they closed, all those good things. So um, so this is about the Battle of the Overpass. This is the house that Harry Bennett built. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan his stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. It was built on 152 acres of remote wooded lands in southeastern Michigan, and the fortifications designed into it would make even Citizen Kane feel safe. But what would possess someone, even in 1930, to build this kind of fortress? If you knew Harry, you'd know why. Harry gets things done in a hurry. That was Henry Ford's way of describing his chief of security, Harry Herbert Bennett. Bennett assembled the Ford Service Department in the early 30s. Some called it the largest private army in the world. Others compared it to the Gestapo. Harry's major assignment at that time was to keep the unions out of Ford Motor Company by any means possible. More often than not, those means were violent. When it came to strike breaking, Harry Bennett was the best. His brutal tactics made him many enemies, and after repeated attempts were made on his life, he and Henry Ford decided a safe house had to be built. Once the United Auto Workers had an agreement at General Motors, Chrysler was the next to sign. Union leaders now looked to include what they feared would be the hardest case of them all, the Ford Motor Company. We knew that we weren't ready to take on Ford, but we had to lay a foundation for the Ford drive. And we knew it would be more difficult than General Motors was because it would be more violent. Henry Ford 
ran the Ford Motor Company as kind of a personal fiefdom. It was his and his alone. It was literally his and his alone. It wasn't a public company. This was truly his baby. He, he saw it grow and virgin, if you will. And it was more than paternalistic. He, uh, he felt an ownership. And therefore, he didn't want to be intruded upon. He didn't want people helping him run his business, which was the essence of the labor movement. So there was a natural conflict there beyond mere sharing of wealth or competing for wealth. It was, you know, this is mine. Henry Ford's River Rouge factory was the ultimate reflection of his preeminence. Set along the river for which it was named, the 2,000-acre facility west of Detroit was the largest concentration of machinery and labor in the world. Employing over 100,000 workers, Ford considered security a priority. He created a management division known as the Service Department to ensure order in his plants but their tactics were not always sound. There was, in the shadows of the Ford Motor Company, the presence of one Harry Bennett, who had developed within the Ford structure a private army of some 5,000, many of whom were armed inside the plant as a security force. Harry Bennett, Ford's henchman and former bodyguard, was an unpredictable character. He kept a gun in his desk and always wore a bow tie, claiming to have been nearly strangled by a necktie in a street fight. Bennett wasn't a gangster, but he hired a lot of people from the Detroit underworld to do the bidding of the Ford Service Department. You know, he hired uh, ex-boxers, ex-wrestlers, uh, ex-strong-arm guys, ex-gunmen, ex-gangsters, anybody who had some kind of a frightening persona about him to keep people from talking about or even trying to organize at the Ford plant. The intention of the whole Ford Service Department was to prevent unionization in any way, shape, or form. On the overpass at Gate 4 in 1937, myself and other people with a group of ministers were standing there on public property, not private property. We went there to make a distribution. The Ford Service men came in. At home, Americans feared red subversion. Congress revived the House Committee on Un-American Activities. In 1947, the committee investigated Hollywood, factory of America's imagination. Have ever observed any communistic information well, in any scripts? And forever. How are you doing, bud? Well, I have turned down quite a few scripts because I thought they were tinged with communistic ideas. They uh, haven't attempted to use me, I don't think, because apparently uh, they know that I'm not very sympathetic to communism.
Labor delegates representing 16 million workers gather in New York for the history-making merger of the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The merger is the culmination of 20 years of effort. Symbolically, Walter Ruther, CIO President, and George Meany, AFL President, declare the meeting open jointly to thunderous applause. The meeting, however, reaches its climax with the nomination of officers for the new AFL CIO organization, largest in the world. Walter Ruther nominates George Meany as president and is himself named one of the 37 vice presidents. From his Gettysburg office, President Eisenhower is among the first to congratulate the new labor body and to call its attention to the grave responsibilities it faces on the national scene. Summertime and the living is easy. Yes, those are great times. Great time. Fish are jumping and cotton is high. Your dad is rich. And By the end of the 1950s, a civil rights revolution was taking place in the South under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. His organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, used nonviolent confrontation and borrowed labor's protest tools in the form of bus boycotts and lunch counter sit-ins to shed a blinding light on racial injustice. The two most dynamic and cohesive liberal forces in the country are the labor movement and the Negro freedom movement. The duality of interests makes any crisis which lacerates you a crisis from which we bleed. The truth of it is not all of the unions were really ready to get involved in the civil rights movement. Walter Ruther, Victor Ruther, United Auto Workers were. They understood that uh, the struggle for human rights was directly related to the struggle for organizing rights. So that is our lives. No, we're not doing a congressional hearing right now. Uh, so that is. The Battle of the Overpass, and it was trying to break the Union into Ford Motor Company, which they knew was going to be the toughest to crack. Like they said, gangster tactics, that kind of stuff. Um, so it was a it was a tumultuous time, um, and a time where unions unions believed in power for themselves. Yeah, it, it's a time where unions were needed. Um, it, it's a time, certainly, where unions were needed, and uh, working conditions were really poor, and there's a lot of things that could have changed and could have gotten better, for sure. Um, and with the advent of the union, but then the union got overpowering, overbearing, and this most recent strike that I covered live from Wayne, Michigan, uh it's i think they've overstayed their welcome and could probably uh probably go away <laughs> yeah nowadays the union abuses you uh so it's come full circle and they probably shouldn't be around anymore uh but they're still going to because they're powerful political organizations uh that aren't going anywhere anytime soon uh so we'll see more of this we'll see more of this in you know the 40s 50s 60s uh into the into the big time riots in in 67 and we'll kind of uh we'll kind of go through and and look at that because riot and violence was unfortunately a part of the city for most of the time after this um and then you had division, like we talked about last week with the wall, that kind of stuff two weeks ago. Um, 
unions are iffy depending on location. I think they were definitely necessary at this point. I think they overstayed their usefulness. So they pay politicians so they can keep their power. Yeah, well, it's a big uh, lobbying circle jerk. So they're going to continue to go back, forth, back, forth. Um, so let me have a let me have a conversation with you, chat. I don't watch movies or television. It's just not my thing. Okay. I have no idea who this guy is, and I know that you guys are going to give me hell for this. Uh, because apparently I should know who he is. But I don't know who he is. I know some of the some of the stuff, but I don't know who this guy is. Francis Ford Coppola is an American film director, producer, and screenwriter, and apparently one of the greatest directors of all time. No idea. No idea. Uh made movies you're a big boy now finnan's rainbow the rain people uh the godfather Patton, um the conversation great gatsby godfather 2 apocalypse now uh godfather part 3 bam stroker's dracula jack the rainmaker Pinocchio, uh, Supernova 2000. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's one of those things that you guys would hate me that I didn't know, but I, I didn't. I've heard of The Godfather. I, I've never, never heard of him. I was about to say that I've never seen it, but I wouldn't say that because that would probably get eight. So I won't confirm or deny that I've seen it. But uh but yeah, apparently he was influential in, in movies and television. I don't know who he is. But here's a little bit of a little bit about him. The this picture just it makes it all make sense. Well he did uh at one point he fainted and kind of he had a collapse and uh he told me that he could see himself going down a dark tunnel and he didn't know if he was dying or leaving this reality or what was happening to him. But he'd gone to the threshold maybe of his um, sanity or something. It was scary, but also kind of exhilarating or thrilling that he would take such risks with himself and his uh, experience to uh, go that far and I think this film was all about risking risking your money risking your uh, uh, your sanity risking your how far you can press your oh, no. family members I mean everything oh, okay. that he did he went to the extremes to test those fringe <laughs> regions and then come back Biden already knows who I am nothing is so terrible as a pretentious movie i mean a movie that aspires uh, to something really. really terrific and doesn't pull it most off, of them are gone it's shit it's scum hayden and everyone will walk on it as such and that's why poor filmmakers in a way that's their greatest horror is to be pretentious so here you are on one hand is trying to aspire to really do something and on the other hand you're not allowed to be pretentious and finally you say fuck it i don't care if i'm pretentious or not pretentious or if i've done it or i haven't done it. all i know is that i am going to see this movie and that for me, it has to have That's some true. answers. Biden doesn't my know answers, who he is. His administration knows who I am. Answers on about sure. 47 different levels. And uh, it's very hard to talk about these things without being very corny. You use a word like self-purgation or epiphany. They think you're either, a, you know, a religious weirdo or, a, you know, an asshole college professor. But those are the words for the process, this transmutation, this renaissance, this rebirth, which is the basis of all life. The one rule that all men, from the time they first were walking around looking up at the sun scratching around for food and an animal to kill, the first with concept that I feel got into their head was the idea of life and death. 
that the sun went down and the sun went up. I know, like I might have been crop when they learned how to make a crop and die. And the winter, that. everything died. And he, to the first man, he must have thought, oh my God, it's the end of the world. And then all of a sudden, there was spring and everything came alive and it was better. I mean, after all, I mean, look at Vietnam. Look at my movie. You'll see what I'm talking. Uh, yeah, so he sounds like a, a Hollywood stoner to me. But, you know, uh, He's your guys' hero, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that that was on the set of Apocalypse Now. I I didn't want to go into something long because I don't know who he is. But, uh, yeah, he was born in 1939 in Detroit, Michigan. So, another Detroit connection to a famous individual. And we end in 1940. So, we continue to grow. Uh, Detroit, Michigan has a population of 1,623,452. So about a hundred grand more people than, than the previous year or the previous census in 1930. Um, so that was from the 1940 United States census, 1.6 million people. So, but yeah, so that is it all the way up to 1940 uh next week we'll not too famous if you don't know who he is well there's a lot of yeah i guess um there's a lot of uh i don't know a lot of the movie stars and stuff like that so or movie people um so yeah so next week we'll continue on our track we'll go uh I'm going to try and go 1940 to 1950, but there's a lot in there. Um, there's also going to be the special program that will be in the probably after next week. So I'll do next week and then we'll do the special program with the World War II bomber plant with the interview and the, everything that I have with the people there. Um, so that will be upcoming. That will be after this week's or this next week's episode. So we'll kind of touch on it and then it'll be a separate uh episode dedicated to just the the bomber plant the tour the uh and the conversation that i had with the the wonderful people so um with that being said that's going to be it for me this evening uh catch me tomorrow for news and yeah, that sounds like what we have. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And I'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody.